Um, in your bags, there is a copy of Knight's Statement of Strategy. And I wanted to read from page four, one sentence, it won't be a long read. We believe in engaged, equitable, and inclusive communities. So now just a mention for the students of history in the room. In 1968, 125 cities in the United States were in flames after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. President Lyndon Johnson had appointed a commission to, uh, to issue a report. It was the Kerner Commission, and they studied the issue of a divided America. I want to quote from that 1968 report. The journalistic profession has been shockingly backward in seeking out hiring and promoting Negroes. Again, that's the Kerner Commission report in 1968. So we've been talking about diversity in journalism since 1968. Diversity, being invited to the table. It's 2020. Today we're talking about inclusion, being welcomed at the table, and equity, shared power at that table, or perhaps building completely new tables. Diversity in 1968, inclusion and equity in 2020. Please join me for this conversation, this very important conversation, and welcoming our moderator, Jenny Choi of the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, it's working technology. Um, so uh, I'm so excited. You have no idea how thrilled I am uh, to be here. This is my, I think, fifth night media forum. And last year I did a breakout session on uh, diversity and um, I facetiously put it out there that we should be on the main stage. And you know, all the years I've been here and I've seen folks on the main stage, I thought, oh my gosh, look at the cool kids. And today, guess what? We're the cool kids. <laughs> so I am so um, uh, grateful, and I, this is such a gratifying moment. I wanted to thank Jennifer Preston, Lashara Bunting, Paul Chung, Karen Runlet, and the journalism team, um, because I want, this is, this is about the panel in, in a sense that we are recognizing the gift of being seen and seeing others, and that is really a gift we should not take for granted as journalists and as funders who support journalism and strengthening communities. So um, I wanted to thank you, Karen, for just beautifully uh, framing uh, the conversation. Um, I wanted to put a few things out here. Uh, so the Night Media Forum has been a critical convening space around uh, trust, right? And um, the declining trust in journalism as a democratic institution. The Knight Commission on Trust, Media, and Democracy last year uh, put forth a set of recommendations on how we can restore trust in journalism. And one of the four recommendations included making sure that our newsrooms we're authentically reflecting the communities that we serve. However, we're seeing that we're struggling with this in our newsrooms. This has been tracked by the American Society of News Editors Diversity Survey, which is annual, and we're seeing that from Pew, we're lagging actually in diversifying our newsrooms uh, compared to any other sector. So how does this play out and in the context of trust and a healthy democracy? Well, we're seeing from NORC research at the University of Chicago that young, age 30, 18 to 34, African American and Latino Latina audiences are not happy, are highly dissatisfied with how they are being conveyed in mainstream media and they distrust the news media compared to any other constituent group. We're also seeing that mis and disinformation campaigns that undermine voter engagement target at disproportionate rates African American communities more than any other community because they're exploiting this trust gap. So what can we do? Amplifying underrepresented communities is an opportunity. We need to reframe this conversation as audiences of opportunity. 
And how do we recognize cultural competencies by journalists? Who gets to say, who gets to tell whose story, right? And really do a deep dive on the structural issues that keep perpetuating this newsroom issue, as we've seen, uh, as Karen mentioned, with the Kerner Commission report over 60 years ago. Um, so I just want to say one last thing. At the Craig Newmar Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY, a lot of young people, we see the next generation of news producers and news consumers. We see these young people come to our school because they love that we promote community-centered journalism and that we promote journalism as a powerful tool for public service, a powerful public service, right, for a healthy democracy where we all can thrive and make healthy civic decisions. But what we're seeing is they learn all of these wonderful skills and they get hired. And what we're hearing now is they're struggling at newsrooms, at their newsrooms and at their jobs. And these journalists of color want to not only leave their jobs, but leave journalism altogether. So if we're talking about addressing this decline of trust, that's an issue that we really need to look at structurally. And the second part of that is some of these journalists of color want to become media entrepreneurs of color and start their own news organization to have their own power. But the access to capital is another structural barrier that a lot of media entrepreneurs of color face. So we have three exemplars, and all of us are wearing a lot of different hats to address this issue on multiple levels. So I'm going to start with Marie Inahosa. Uh, and I'm going to, you know, sometimes when folks tell the bios, like you forget who the person is, so I want to try to keep it in context. Um, so Maria Inahosa, I wanted to start with you. You are the president and co-founder of Futuro Media Founder. Founder. And what I love about the name is it's Futuro. <laughs> and um, before we talk about why you started Futuro Media Group, I wanted to talk about you as an anchor and executive producer of Latino USA because about a month ago, you, um, I want to get the dirt on the episode called Digging Into American Dirt. Um, I think on so many levels, <laughs> on so many levels, um, it really encapsulates why Latino USA was uniquely positioned to bring much needed context to a very content contentious debate, um, especially around identity and the audiences that you serve and that you are loyal to. So could you talk a little bit more about digging into American Dirt? Yes. <laughs> I want to know the how of that journalism and some of the decision making that went into that. Um, thank you, Jenny. Love the dress. Thank you. Um, what's up, everybody? Good morning uh, to my fellow panelists. Uh, this is great to be back at the forum. So. It was interesting because, you know, Latino USA, which is produced by Futuro Media, we're trying to drop the group, so Futuro Media, um, is now the only show on NPR that is growing a substantial audience. Um, we produce it at Futuro Media, which is the nonprofit that I founded 10 years ago, and NPR distributes it. Um, and, you know, Latino USA has been around. You may not know this, but it's been around for, well, I, I started anchoring when I was five. So it's been around for 25, 26 years now. I know, it's amazing. I had a really deep voice when I was born. Um, so Latino USA has always been a show that is kind of thought provoking. Um, it's not really a breaking news show. We're not set up in that way. But interestingly, within our newsroom, we've had to have the conversation about how Latinos and Latinas are actually leading a lot of news, and therefore we've had to respond, which is, a challenge for a small nonprofit newsroom. But I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. Over the summer, there was Puerto Rico, where massive protests in a part of our American democracy led to the resignation, forced resignation of the governor. Mm -hmm. Then there, there was the El Paso massacre of Mexicans and Mexican Americans um, in a targeted hate crime. Um, right after that, it was the uh, detention and arrest of 700 poultry workers in a small towns right side of Jackson, Mississippi, where I was just last week, where we're doing a follow-up. Um, and then, you know, our newsroom was like, oh my God, this is so much. And then American Dirt happened right at the beginning of the year. 
And we had to make a decision of like, so this is not a massacre, it's not a political protest, it's not, you know, this, but it is a massive cultural moment in the United States where we're talking about American dirt. Um, if you don't know about it, then just listen to the episode and then, you know, um, you'll understand. You're right, Jenny, and I won't go on for much longer about this, but we, when you say uniquely positioned, we were. Um, because we are um, a small nonprofit, community-based national newsroom, we're based on 125th Street in the heart of Harlem, come visit us. Um, and because we have this long history of all of these words that just came up just this morning, uh, trust, authenticity, Sir Tim, wherever you are, talked about love, because I was like, do I talk about love on this panel? I don't know. But yeah, he talked about it, so now I can talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, the way we approach our journalism, the fact that Futuro was founded by a Mexican-born American citi citizen who was raised on the south side of Chicago, now lives in Harlem. Our executive director is a black woman from Mississippi, Boston, now based in Harlem. Erica Dilde, who's over there. Our board chair is Deepa Donde, who is of Indian American descent from New Jersey. Where are you guys? Raise your hands over there in the corner. Um, so we are an all woman led, multi ethnic newsroom where it is about bringing your whole self into the newsroom. And that doesn't mean that we don't have editorial battles. We had a lot of battles around American Dirt. To finish with that, we just realized, we have to do this story. I called Sandra Cisneros. I was like, will you do this? She was like, yes. Called Luis Alberto Urrea, who I know, right, because we've been reporting on these authors for years. Will you do this? Called este, Miriam Gurba, who wrote the scathing takedown of American Dirt. Would she do this? And Janine Cummins said yes. And what we did was that we did not push our perspective. And by the way, it's very complicated. If you want to know more about how I feel, listen to In the Thick, which is our politics podcast. But for Latino USA, we let those four interviews stand alone and let these people speak for themselves. And it was just wildly applauded because of the fact that we were not putting a, you know, this is how it must be looked at and we're gonna tell you this and you can't let other people, you know, write these stories. No, we let the authors, and in this case, just they're all authors, speak for themselves. Um, and I think that just to end, it's, it's really quite beautiful to realize that a show that's been around for all of these years that frankly um, NPR thought would, when we created it um, 25 years ago, 26 years ago, I think they thought it would be around for maybe five years. We're going gangbusters. How does that happen? It happens, and again, I'm gonna go back to Sir Tim. Um, because of the passion and love and commitment, writ large for American journalism, writ large, very specifically for the telling of these stories with heart. And we, Erica, myself, Deepa, have created a newsroom where we encourage that, all of that to be brought in and then to be critically dissected and used in a, in a newsroom that is filled with people of different generations and we go at it as journalists. But what you said, cultural competency, is actually where we start. As a media executive, we talk about this a lot with our leadership team. How do we understand, bring cultural competency into our newsroom? And audience opportunity, we know. That's why our numbers are just because we've been saying for the longest time it's about being representative, right, in our newsrooms, but also, hello, demographics. Who's going to be your audience? Who's going to be your donors? We've been focused, I've been focused on that for the entirety of my career, and thankfully it's paying off. That's great. So um, I wanted to actually um, have you wear your entrepreneur hat. Um, it's been 10 years since you founded Futuro Media Group. And um, that's how I'm gonna bring Martin into the conversation, who's the co-executive director of the Maynard Institute. So you founded Futuro Media Group as a nonprofit news organization. Um, and finding capital and securing philanthropic dollars 
um, as we know, and we have to kind of go there, um, is difficult. Painful. Women and um, <laughs> folks of color. Uh, a stat, uh, the Democracy Fund had done um, really great research um, on this and found that from 2013 to 2017, of the $1.1 billion that went into journalism, about 8% of that went to diversity, equity, and inclusion focused efforts. So how did you find that money to start Futuro, and how's the sustainability um, problem or challenge been for you? Okay, so a quick story. You don't, please don't tweet this out, but it is in my upcoming memoir. Ooh, shameless <laughs> self-promotion comes out in September. Anyway, um, <laughs> it was 10 years ago that I went to have um, a meeting with 60 Minutes. That's why I don't want you guys to, and I was so thrilled. I should have understood that they asked for the meeting at a Starbucks, so maybe that was a clue. It was a great meeting, um, nonetheless, and they drew, you know, they were like, oh my God, we love you, you're so perfect, but can you wait until one of these old white guys gets sick or dies? And I was like, am I laughing, am I crying? I didn't know, I got in the subway, I cried, and I said, what am I gonna do? And so what I'm saying to you is that it was just this kind of like, what, what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do, how am I gonna figure this out? And I thought about, not other women, who had created independent nonprofit newsrooms, I thought about actors, actresses in Hollywood. I was like, what did they do? They created their own. I'm gonna create this, how am I gonna do it? I had learned how to raise money because I was working at Now on PBS. Um, and I was very blessed that a woman who had done Reiki on me to heal me from PTSD post 9-11 turned out to be a multi, multi-millionaire philanthropist. That works out. <clears throat> I know, and she treated me for free. Okay, it's Fiona Druckenmiller. Uh, some of you may know Fiona, um, Stanley Druckenmiller. Fiona was my healer, um, and so in, frankly, in desperation, I was like, this is, I was like, who am I, I can't call the Ford Foundation, MacArthur, Knight, you know, they don't know, I mean, they, they don't know me. I, Fiona knew me, she knew my heart, in fact, and I said, I wanna do this, and she was, Without Fiona, nothing, this would not exist. So that is strange and crazy and a bit of an opportunity. It's also as a journalist, I was a journalist even when I was on the Reiki table, because I was like, who is this woman who's doing this for free? I need to find out, and there you have it. But that, you know, luck, part of it, you know, gangbusters, but it is hard. And one of the arguments I made to Fiona, I remember, and this was 10 years ago, I was. I don't know what the statistic was, but it was like of all the money that is put out there for um, you know, in, uh, investment in women, in, in, in any news company, media, whatever, the amount given to women is like 1%. And I was like, that's the number that I need you to help me. And that's how it all started. Mm. Thank you. Now we're funded by every, well, not by everybody. We please come talk to me. <laughs> so on that, Martin uh, Reynolds, the co-executive director of the Maynard Institute, a training ground for journalists of color, so all of the things that we're talking about, but I wanted to start with you um, and some of the provocative ideas you had in sustaining, as a nonprofit organization, this effort to support journalists of color. Um, you embarked, you were key to a new strategic planning for the Maynard Institute after Dory's passing. And it was so interesting how the strategic planning process was so ambitious. And I'm thinking you looked up and saw two people to do all that work. So I'm just curious um, how you've sustained um, your business operations. Well, you know, people of color, we don't, it doesn't need a lot of us to get a lot done. Um, and everybody that puts in a color knows that. Uh, so, I mean, I think what, I mean, we had help, obviously, we had help from Knight to help with the uh, funding of the strategic plan. We had help with, we had friends in, in, in the philanthropic community because of the, uh, the organization's long history. The Maynard Institute's the oldest uh, journalism nonprofit dedicated to help America's newsrooms reflect the diversity of the nation. And we've done that. Uh, and some of its founders, it really was born out of the Kerner Commission strife that talked about the lack of diversity in mainstream media, and some of our founders include Bob Maynard, who went on to be the first African-American to own a major metropolitan daily, the Oakland Tribune, where I was editor-in-chief, and then, of course, Dorothy Gilliam, who just came out with an amazing memoir, Trailblazer. She was the first African-American woman at the Washington Post in 1963. So these people were trailblazers of their time, and the goal was to train journalists 
to enter into news organizations and make their way. Uh, I'm not only uh, a journalist, but also was a graduate of Maynard Media Academy in 2005. So I, I believe in its mission, and it helped me go from managing editor to leading my newsroom. But then <clears throat> after Dory had passed in 2015, and the organization is really qu making the, asking the question, sh should we even exist? Right, uh, because at that time, news organizations were still trying to uh, navigate coming out of the Great Recession. Obviously, the industry had vastly changed, and the primary customers of the Maynard Institute were newspaper companies. Mm -hmm. And they were going through a lot of uh, struggle, which uh, many are still today. And so we had to ask ourselves, well, I guess we could have waited six more months until after the 2016 election to ask, should a diversity organization still exist? We got that affirmed, yes, we should have. But we also then robustly thought about what are, how do we serve this industry in the 21st century? And one of those uh, programs was Maynard 200. And it was a, a training program where we were going to focus on the next generation of journalism entrepreneurs, advanced leaders, and storytellers of color. And the reason we said storytellers is because uh, we, found, we ran a program called Oakland Voices in Oakland, California, where we trained residents to be storytellers. started in 2010, before much of this was even happening. And it helped to inform this notion that the people who are contributing to the narrative of community are more than just journalists, right? They are members of community. So we called them storytellers. And thank you. And so the thinking there also was we still want to train middle managers and advanced leaders, people who, people who are working in organizations and leadership roles at mid-level, but also those who could become CEOs. Because the reality is, uh, the way change happens in news organization is from the top down. There isn't an Arab Spring of diversity that just comes out of the ground <laughs> and it's just going to happen. It doesn't work that way. If it doesn't happen from the top, it's not going to happen. And the third was journalism entrepreneurs. Why? Because we cannot, in good conscience, continue to funnel people of color into legacy news organizations that are inhospitable, unwilling to change, and um, are not places that are healthy for young uh, people of color and different generations to go. And so that's where, and so this training organization, we're now in our third iteration. Uh, we've had support from Google News Initiative, from uh, uh, News Integrity, also from uh, Knight, from Ford and Democracy Fund and others. Uh, to help support this effort. But it's undercapitalized, and in fact, we think it's so essential. And to see these people uh, who are creating their own narratives, who are having the opportunity to step in and lead organizations, and storytellers who are learning skills like around investigative reporting, the love in the room and those in that training space hopefully helps to give them a cake, a cape to walk into these organizations and undertake these incredibly challenging ventures that they're doing across these three areas of learning. Uh, the other work that we're doing is uh, we want to go from having conversations about diversity to creating workplaces that are equitable and inclusive in service of diversity. It's not DEI, it's EID. Because you can have people that are diverse in a newsroom but if they have no agency and no influence, they leave. Yeah. So what we want to do is help organizations do that. And so we got a, a grant from Knight to, to pilot, thanks to Lashara and Jennifer, uh, to pilot an embed where we are going to go embed ourselves, burrow in like a tick with two news organizations <laughs> over the next year and help them create a plan, craft, training, all of the things necessary to, to actually make transformation. And I think what's really key here is it can't be the moral obligation. Right. And the business case hasn't really sunk into y'all either. Even though in uh, 2045, 14 million people alone will be multiracial. Twice that will be Asian, uh, three times that will be black, and four times that will be Hispanic. So I, I want to do two things. One, let's not say voices from underrepresented communities. Let's say yes. voices from your future yes. audience. Thank you. And if you want to survive and thrive in the 21st century, we are your audience. And lastly, but not leastly, I also just want to say that um, we have to, as we think about how do you address the diversity challenge, it has to be tethered to outcomes. 
right? The outcome being what is the key to your most prosperous and sustainable future as a news organization, not simply the moral obligation. Uh, because that hasn't worked in the business case, hasn't necessarily worked either. The other part is what you alluded to, which is the notion of trust. The trust project, headed by Sally Lerman, funded by Greg Newmark, and contributed by many news organizations uh, to, to articulate transparency standards uh, on, on the web. Two, they have eight core indicators. And of the eight, two explicitly speak to diversity. So. At a time of great distrust in our society, if you want to be viewed as trustworthy and credible, diversity has to be at the center of your strategic plan. So I just encourage folks to think strategically about how does this help you reach new audiences, mm -hmm. to connect to communities, and uh, build subscriber revenue. And the reality is, is that it takes time to build relationships to communities that you have ignored. Uh, and don't think you can just walk in with a bouquet of flowers talking about, why don't you subscribe? We're so happy to have you. It's not going to work like that. It's going to be take time, and it's incremental. It's relationship by relationship, person by person, and to all the community foundations in the room, I would say this, and then I'll stop, is that this is an opportunity for you to get behind narrative change work in your respective communities and to collaborate with libraries and people in communities because libraries are heavily trusted. Community foundations was often focused on workforce development and economic development. The reality is a community cannot be healthy, it cannot be prosperous if local journalism is not supported. So uh, there's a number of foundations that do this, like the California Endowment and others, but <sighs> the opportunity is, is great. You just need to go grab it. And lucky for us, we have a community foundation CEO right next to you. Um, this is Jeff Roda, CEO of uh, Community Foundation Boulder County. And uh, I really appreciated um, you looking at the 150 community uh, social and health indicators of the Boulder County region and um, putting forth this intentionality around uh, utilizing an equity lens in your funding. So Jeff, you've heard Maria and Martin just kind of throw the gauntlet, and as a community foundation, I'm curious what using an equity lens looks like, and would love to hear um, some of the community listening tours and cultural brokers that you've talked about um, to strengthen your community. Yeah, so note to self, um, <laughs> never follow Maria and Martin, especially if you're not a cool kid. Um, well, you're cool. <laughs> But with regard to the equity lens, and by equity we mean creating systems where all can thrive. And it really boils down to three core principles for us. The first is prioritizing those most impacted by inequity. The second is something we call do nothing about us without us, which is simply trusting the wisdom and agency of the people with lived experience to know their own issues and to create and implement their own solutions. And the third is not to do anything on our own that we can create more change by working together in partnership. And the form that that's taken has been through the, the work that we've done as a community foundation that has begun to fold into and intersect with journalism. Um, I can think back to the School Readiness Initiative where Richard Garcia, a trustee at the time, asked two key questions of us. Um, who are we really talking about and who's not here? And who we were talking about were Latinx kids who were experiencing the largest school achievement gap with their Anglo peers of any county in the state, and who wasn't there were their parents, um, which led to a movement of school readiness coordinators, principally Latina moms, uh, going from house to house, providing resources, recruiting leaders, which led to 50 such coordinators, uh, 250 cafecitos, and 1,900 Latino families that were reached, and demonstrable results in school readiness as well as a burgeoning movement of community organizing that changed, for example, the school lunch principles with regard to Latino kids. And then through the Knight Community Information Lab, we began to learn more about human-centered design and cultural brokers and how they could create structural change. Um, this sort of dovetailed with open listening sessions that we were doing throughout the community where we just asked three questions of people. Uh, in your lived experience, how are you feeling about your community? What are the most important issues to you, and what should we do about them together? 
And when we got to 15 people, we just opened up another one. Um, but we came to realize pretty early on that there were some people who would never come to an open listening session and that we needed to go to them, again, with trusted relationships and cultural brokers to where they gathered um, Section 8 housing, um, LGBTQ support groups, and one particularly memorable listening session with simult simultaneous translation with promotoras who were working and living in mobile home parks um, organizing for clean water and human rights. And when we asked them the last question, what can we do together, they said, tell our story to the powerful people, which was heartbreaking because we knew no one could tell their story better than they could themselves, um, that they were powerful and compelling, um, and that we needed to find a way to help them do that. Um, so that empowerment was not conferring power, but recognizing power and agency. Um, this led to sort of a, a, a question about the community indicators report that you mentioned. This is it, this is trends. Um, it comes out every other year. It has so for the last, uh, for the last 23 years, feels like 123 years. Um, and we began to ask how might a community foundation act at the intersection of journalism and community action? Uh, we're fortunate in that Chris Barge who is the managing editor of this report, is also a former newspaper reporter with the Rocky Mountain News and the Boulder Daily Camera. And I worked at the ABC affiliate for about five years. And Lily Weinberg helped connect us to Lindsey Green Barber, who helped write a concept paper and research a concept paper on how we might work at this intersection, which led to something we're calling the Equity Reporting Initiative, which is a big title for something we're just trying. Uh, the first aspect of it is to respond to the community request to expand trends to a year-round dynamic storytelling resource. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we launched a podcast in conjunction with KGNU, the public radio station in our community, and hired a Latina bilingual cultural broker as its first reporter, who's already a trusted voice. The first story was indeed the story of the promotoras, um, and then we are now telling stories of census outreach and combining them with community foundation resources uh, and solutions that way. Um, and that's been supported by both Knight and Karen Runlett and the Jacques and Littlefield Foundation. The second aspect of the Equity Reporting Initiative um, is something we call the Solutions Fund, which is when these stories uh, surge up from community storytellers. Um, one of the frustrations that Chris and I had as former journalists is we would tell these stories and then we kind of have to leave them at the water's edge, hoping that somebody would pick them up and act upon them. And we thought, could we not do that as a community foundation? Is that not what we're supposed to be doing when we learn these stories to, to act as a catalyst uh, for the solutions? And then the third aspect, which you're way ahead on, in fact, I sort of buttonholed Martin yesterday on uh, the, an equity reporting lab which would be a cohort of equity fellows, um, emerging storytellers and journalists, as well as seasoned journalists who, are, who have been sidelined with the hollowing out of uh, local news in our community and the acquisition of the Denver Post, the Boulder Daily Camera, and the Longmont uh, Observer, uh, Times Call, rather, um, all acquired by Alden Global Capital. And despite the heroic efforts of these journalists, um, really a, a need for a a new and diverse ecosystem of, of local news. Um, so that cohort bringing people together and providing resources of learning as well as stipends for their reporting, um, these are things that we're trying with the, the lessons of resident leadership, um, community organizing, cultural brokers pointing toward this North Star of equity. We're very much in the beginning stages and we hope that if we walk this road with some humility um, we'll be granted some grace as we stumble our way through learning, and we're very inspired uh, and honored to be with all of you who have been doing this work for a while now, um, learning from you and your support. Wonderful. So um, I just wanted to ask all of you a couple of questions. Um, it's on everyone's mind, and Maria, you touched upon this, and Jeff, um, in your work, Census and Elections 2020. Um, how, does all, how, do, how does all of your work kind of inform how you're going to reach your audiences to inspire folks to get counted, 
folks to engage and feel that sense of efficacy, which is the strongest driver um, f uh, for civic engagement. Efficacy meaning I actually have the agency to make a difference if I do this thing for, um, through, for my community. So um, anyone can take a stab at it? You know, I think when, when I think back to um, a decade ago when I was imagining Futuro, I, it was a very um, visceral understanding that by giving representation and voice, we are also acknowledging their power and in telling the story. My dream o vision has always been that in telling your stories, you begin to recognize your own power and then you act on that power. Um, I would say that in the decade of Futuro Media, we, and I, I actually, now I'm like, how, how would we prove that? Like, what would be the data? Like, what, how would we get that? And I'm sure that we could. But I think what we're doing now, it's not so much, because we're a nonprofit newsroom where, you know, we put out uh, four podcasts every week, um, just weekly. So it's not like we're doing a, you know, this is the census and partake. No, it's not that way. It is much more understanding. Um, so for example, we just got back from Mississippi, where outside of Jackson there was this raid of 700 people, the largest raid ever in, um, in this country's history of a poultry plant uh, of workers. And the census actually says that the population in these towns of Latinos and Latinas is minuscule. But the, on the ground, if you're there, I was there for four days, um, for three days. I didn't see any white people at all in these towns that I was at. And yet the census says that they are, I don't remember the exact number, but maybe 5%, 7% Latinx. What's the, when actually it feels like much more, like more like 25%, 30%, maybe more is actually on the ground. So I hope that in the doing the deep, deep reporting that we're doing by spending all of these days by giving voice, that then we are able to kind of, again, push people to say, we need to be counted, we need to be seen. There's another problem though, which goes to your question of trust. We have a real issue of trust now. While all of this is happening and there are presidential debates happening and people are looking at you know, Nevada and South Carolina, I'm getting texts from people across the country, including in New York City, frantic text, texts from people who are saying, ICE is everywhere. ICE is everywhere. Because you may have seen the headline that said that it was a couple of weeks ago that said that uh, the administration was going to be sending out um, tactical teams of ICE in, you know, high profile, whatever, you know, just kind of massive <coughs> presence in the community. It was a big story. Most people forgot about it, but right now that is happening in these communities. How do you tell them to answer a census or open the door for a census counter? when everything that they're hearing is, you don't open the door to anyone, ever. Ha sadly, t saying to people, don't open the door to the police unless you absolutely see a warrant, because also ICE agents misrepresent themselves as police. We know this, right? They wear uniforms that say police everywhere and ICE in smaller letters. This is a central um, tension in that we're trying to say, we're giving you voice, we're giving you recognition, we're giving you power by reporting on you, telling your stories authentically with love and respect, but at the same time, people are saying, if, if, um, if, this, if this administration is reelected and DACA is not re-upped, um, re the government has the data of all of these tens of thousands of people who signed up for DACA. And there, the knock on the door is real. We're doing this, but the knocks on the doors happened this morning, right here. At five o'clock in the morning, ICE went out, because <clears throat> that's when they go, five, six o'clock in the morning when everybody's asleep, that's when they're taking people. That's happening at the same time that the census is happening. Yeah, you know, 
I've been sort of looking at this from the perspective of you know, how to talk to journalism organizations about their role in local communities. And, you know, I, when the whole newspaper business was collapsing, I had to sort of reinvent, and I got to be an, a community engagement editor in 2009, or excuse me, 2011, and I had uh, no staff and no budget, so that was fun. And, but it gave me a real glimpse into how to rethink the role of a journalist in community. And most, uh, last, last year and then this year, uh, the Institute held a convening, one with community activists and journalists to talk about what can activists teach journalists about rebuilding trust. And then we doubled that up again this year and had a collaboration with our friends at Free Press and Alicia Bell who put on this fantastic training about sort of mapping your community with community organizers uh, to talk about what, can, how, what organizing principles journalists need to use to reconnect to community. And I think this is really important because this notion of trust that Maria just mentioned is real, the lack of trust. And, journal, and one of the things that the activists and organizers said is that they're a lot more journalistic than we give them credit for and we're a lot more activist than journalists would like to admit. And what we activate around is news and information, right? And so we are tra seeking to transform ourselves, in many cases, from ad-based revenue to subscriber-based revenue. And how are you going to build relationships with community, with folks who don't know you, trust you, and in service of informing them about what is happening in community? And so I think that there's this, all this conversation about engagement, and it's so often data-driven. And the reality is, is engagement is person to person. And I think we need to go from having simply engagement editors that are looking at you know, screens and analytics to organizing editors that work in news organizations to build trust and relationships with community. And to think about what that would mean, the way in which, and I, and I also think when you look back on sort of the role that advertising has played in news organizations, imagine if from the very beginning, particularly in mainstream news organizations, the relationship, not the advertiser, the relationship to community, how different our approach to people would be. And now here we are in 2020, so many organizations are seeking to pivot from advertising, some are nonprofit and so on and so forth, but those in mainstream pivot from advertising to subscriber-based models. So we want people to support us when we have mischaracterized them. And the other part is that, are we going to recommit the original sin of journalism? So who is getting money now to invest in these new ventures? And are, are they explicitly being asked, what is your plan to connect with community? What are the benchmarks and deliverables? We sure get a bunch of deliverables from foundations to do this and do that. But where are theirs? And who gets? <laughs> the tens of millions of dollars to start ventures. And here's what I'm going to say, and I'm just going to be real. <laughs> if you want to recommit the original sin of mainstream journalism, which is to disenfranchise whole swaths of community, I suggest that they go by the way of the pterodactyl. <laughs> and that we then redirect those resources in the philanthropic community to institutions and organizations that have a commitment and see the value of the audiences of the future. That would be my suggestion, my hope, and my belief that is necessary. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. <laughs> Super. Thank you. A couple of questions, one in the back. Hi, uh, thank you so much for this fantastic panel. My name is Summer Lopez. I'm with PEN America. And um, I'm thinking a bit about the panel we had yesterday as well about hateful content online. and. Uh, of course, we all know much of that is targeted to silence uh, individuals of color and particularly reporters of color. So I'm, that's something we're thinking and working on, but I'm wondering how you're all thinking about that and addressing it in your work. Ay, Dios. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I just went through an experience actually this weekend. Maybe I'll just use it as an example. Um, um, I'm, I'm not a contributor to MSNBC, but I'm often asked to be on. 
Um, so I, I'm not a paid contributor. It's an important distinction for me. Um, <clears throat> but I, I did happen to, um, when Nevada was happening, um, I did happen to throw a question out to uh, Bernie Sanders. Um, it was a journalistic question, but it was like, and <clears throat> on Twitter. And, you know, I, I think what I tried to do is I was like, okay, so how am I gonna, how am I gonna use this and actually flip it and try to create dialogue so that, so that whatever is perceived as anything hateful um, can somehow, I can model how to say, talk to me. I'm, I'm listening to you. If you put words in my mouth and you misconstrue what I said, it's not gonna be good. But I'm gonna try to listen. So that's one way, a tiny way in which, <clears throat> and again, as we've been saying, and Martin is saying, a lot of this is just human to human, right? So I'm trying to model how we take a situation that could have just like <laughs> exploded and gotten really nasty, and to try to, to revert it into something that I hope could model a little bit of, of being productive. And, and we have a, oh, oh sorry. And, and, and I was just gonna yeah. say, this notion of, <clears throat> this notion of hate is very real if you're a journalist of color. So I like to make a joke because I think laughter is also really important. So the joke is, is that I'm five things that this president doesn't like. I'm Mexican, I'm an immigrant, I'm a journalist, I'm a woman, and I'm flat chested. <laughs> so, um, you know, so when people are like talking about feeling fear right now, Okay. Um, <clears throat> <Behave> yourself. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, I'm like, hey, I wasn't born in this country. I, I wasn't born here. I became a citizen. And so I understand when people are talking about fear and how that fear looks. And I, every single day, have to just be like, it's good. I think a lot about Martin Luther King, and he rest in peace and that it's just, it's good, it's good, this is all good, nothing is gonna happen, it's gonna be positive. But at the same time, um, the piece that's coming up on Latino USA, I think next week or the week after, we went to Milwaukee because um, a Peruvian American citizen went to get a taco and some guy threw acid on his face, battery acid on his face. Um, and hate crimes against Latinos are the fastest growing, have surpassed now hate crimes against Muslims. So this is real, the hate is real. Our last question. Hello, first of all, great panel, thank you so much. My name is Kyra Kyles and I represent a nonprofit media organization called Wire Media, formerly Youth Radio. And my question is, you know, I've spent 20 years in journalism, I think one of the fixes that mainstream media has tried to offer up is fellowships, 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 I know. And so what I'd like to hear from the panel is Trigger. a meaningful way that we can make change within these mainstream <clears throat> newsrooms that are not hospitable um, so that we can end the you know, fellowship apocalypse, as I would call it. Mm. <laughs> I think that's so well said. You know, fellowships are an interesting thing, right? Because uh, they seem like tremendous opportunity, especially the good paying ones that actually have benefits now, right? Uh, but what ends up happening with folks is that they're often the least senior and the tethered to often uh, grant funding that can be fleeting because foundations have obviously a lot of priorities and there's a ton of need. And, and, they are, and so they, all of a sudden they, they, they create this like, mirage of diversity because you have people that come in, they're doing great journalism, but they aren't in the C-suite. They're not making strategic decisions about the organization. They're not tethering things to revenue initiatives that are key, right? It's not connected to money. It's connected to content. But nevertheless, they're still incredibly important, and they provide great opportunities. I think what needs to really happen here is that there has to be a collective understanding that pipeline is key and that news organizations actually need to think of themselves as their own dare I say, farm system, that you need to grow your own from within with a plan to bring people from here to here, that they don't just come in, they're not transient, right? They are a part of a strategic, uh, uh, a positive part of the strategic uh, goals of the organization. Uh, because fellowships, while they're wonderful, uh, they are not uh, a, 
a fix for the diversity problem that is facing these organizations. So I think one thing philanthropy could do is maybe creating a collective pool that funds uh, early on uh, a, a, a fellowship program that could be sort of almost for the entire sector, right? But I think for organizations that are larger, have revenue, that they need to actually think of a strategy around diversity. How does this align? They do this all the time with revenue initiatives. So how does the people, how does making people a part of your, uh, the hierarchy in the organization to go from junior to senior to leadership to heading it, how is that tethered to your most sustainable future? So it, it can't just be a program. It has to be about what the business is uh, uh, tethered to the success of the operation. And on that, um, thank you, Martin. I think um, when you put it also back to newsrooms to ensure that um, journalists of color don't have to be poor to continue on fellowship after fellowship um, to thrive and get a full-time paying salary job. Um, also, I think, Maria, Maria, to your point on addressing online hate speech, we also have to hold newsrooms accountable. Um, what can newsrooms do to protect <laughs> journalists who are targeted and create conditions of safety? It shouldn't just be on the journalist to handle it. Um, we need new systems and protocols to, um, to support journalists of color and ensure their safety and that they can thrive and do their best work. So I want to thank my well-esteemed panelists, Jeff Rhoda, Martin Reynolds, and Maria Inosa. And thank you all for sharing in this conversation with us. <laughs>